1 John chapter 2. I've titled this Walking in the Light because we're going to see how important that is as believers. One thing, you know, in the day and age we live in today, it's kind of very hard. It's, it's difficult to teach the Bible verse by verse in the day and age we live in today because most people consider their Christianity their religion. And so they come, you know, on Sunday or whatever, and you, you, you do your Christian thing, and then you go live your life and do as you please. And, and yet, the Word of God is given to us by God that it might pierce our hearts, teach us how He wants us to live, teach us how He wants to lead our life, teach us how we should be taken captive, really, by the Holy Spirit, and then learn to follow things His way. And it's really difficult sometimes when you're teaching verse by verse because a lot of people just don't want to hear it because you touch every subject. And, and 1 John here deals a lot with sin. And he calls sin what it is, sin. And he deals with it. We're going to look at it pretty deeply today. But uh, it's just what it is. Anyway, last week we saw that the believers that he was writing to, that as believers we have fellowship with the Father by the blood of Jesus Christ. So, one thing, you're never alone, ever. If you're a believer, you're a Christian, you're born again, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are not alone. You have fellowship with the Father. And fellowship, when you have that fellowship with Him, when you are willing to yield to Him and step into His presence and do things His way and walk under His guidance, it produces in your life the joy of the Lord. And when the joy of the Lord becomes active and alive in your life, it changes your whole life. It transforms you and it changes the way you view things for the rest of your life. Because then you begin to view things God's way and not your way. So one of the things that John presses in his book, especially to overcome Gnosticism, was it is teaching that fellowship is Jesus' answer to the loneliness of life and the joy of the Lord is Jesus' answer to the emptiness or to the hollowness of life. It is learning to walk in those things. So in having fellowship with the Father at all times, it produces within us the joy of the Lord. And what that does is it equips me then to turn from sin. The joy of the Lord is the knowledge, the knowing deep inside me that I belong to Him. That my sin is forgiven. That I have been washed clean. That anything I do in this world, if I stumble and sin, which I'm going to do, He still loves me and that security is there. That's the joy of the Lord. In any situation I'm in, I know my Father in heaven loves me because my faith and trust is in His Son. And that security is what equips me to look at sin in my life and say, you know what? Goodbye. I don't have the ability. What we touched on last week, John really drove home the point. As a human being, I do not have the ability within me to turn from sin. I don't have it. None of us do. Yet, I've been given a brand new life in Christ. That's His Holy Spirit. And I have assurance, the assurance of that God the Father loves me. I have fellowship with Him. It produces the joy of the Lord in my heart. And that's what equips me. It's His joy in me that makes me hate sin, look at it detestingly, and turn away from it. And it's an amazing truth. And Gnosticism, that religious part of it, doesn't want to hear that. Because first of all, I have to be willing to call sin, sin in my life. I have to be willing to look at sin God's way in my life and deal with it the way God wants me to, which is trusting His Son. So, so that's a very important role, foundation that John laid last week as we looked at in the Word. But here in the second part of the chapter, he teaches the believers the importance of walking out their Christian faith, as in this, this new life that we now have, we step by faith in, we, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ to be saved as our Savior, all of a sudden what's into our life is something that was never there for. It's called salvation. 
And salvation, when that comes into my life, it doesn't mean the end of my old nature. When salvation comes into my life, I now have an old nature and I now have a new nature. I have an old life and I have a new life. But a lot of Christians think that when salvation happens in their life, that's the end of their old life. And yet we still sin, so when you sin, you try to deal with it your way, and it produces just nothing but a big mess. And, and really, that's what John's touching on uh, in the rest of this chapter, uh, or the first part of this, the second part of this chapter. It's walking out the Christian faith. And walking involves progress, and as believers, we're called of God to advance in our Christian life. You should not be at the same place you were two years ago in your Christian walk. You should be advancing closer to the Father, trusting Him more, sharing His Son with others in a greater way, facing the challenges that you, that you faced before that you caved in on, and then today facing them by faith in the Son of God and letting Him see you through them. So, so like a child that has to learn to walk and over time overcome many of the difficulties that are before them, so too a Christian life must learn to walk in the light. What does it mean to walk in the light? And, and that's what John touches on. You know, I think the overwhelming difficulty in every Christian life, and this is what we don't want to believe, is sin. You can call any situation you want and say, that's the circumstance, this is the heaviness of my life, it's alcoholism, it's drugs, it's, it's family problems, it's issues you don't know about, it's my past, on and on and on and on. Stop. The overwhelming difficulty in any Christian life is sin. And it's not sin like the outside uh, disobedience, it's mainly the inner rebellion of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Mm -hmm. The stuff we don't want to deal with. And what John does to deal with Gnosticism is he hits it right on the head. And he said this has to be dealt with. There are things you have to know from God to, to walk out your Christian life. And they're very important to know. Never in the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments, does God whitewash the sins of the saints. Ever. God set up a, a, a system for the Old Testament saints to be forgiven through the sacrificial system that he gave, which was a picture of what was to come. That's Jesus Christ. And today as believers, our sins are covered and bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the fact that we still sin really bothers many believers, especially new Christians, because it's easy to forget that in receiving the new nature, it doesn't, it doesn't eliminate the old nature that we're born with. So we're sitting here today, and if you call yourself a Christian, you have two natures, the old one and the new one. And those two natures battle against one another. And no amount of self-discipline on your side, no amount of man-made rules and regulations can control these natures. Only the Holy Spirit of God can enable us to put to death the old nature and produce within us the fruits of the Spirit through the new nature. And when you read in the Bible, you read things like Ananias and Sapphira and how God killed them on the spot because they lied to Peter, they lied to the Holy Spirit. So when, when sinning saints, I guess you could say, are mentioned in the Bible, um, it's, they're not mentioned to discourage us, but they're, they're mentioned to warn us of the dangers, the true dangers of falling, drifting away in our faith in Christ. Because I, we can easily drift away from faith and put on the cloak of religion and say, okay, I'm all set, I'm, I'm all set before God. And God said, you may be all set before me for salvation, but you're not all set before me in your Christian walk and in your testimony and in your witness to others. Because you, you walk in sin and you don't acknowledge that sin that you walk in and it's bearing fruit in your life to the people around you. You come home, instead of being having the joy of the Lord, you come home cranky and you blow up when someone says the wrong word. 
Someone doesn't agree with you in something, and you have to have the last say, so you put your foot down and you get louder and louder and louder. And God say, Do you, you, you can't admit that sin. You can't come before me. You say I saved you. You say you love me. But do you follow my commandments? And my commandment is to love one another. And that's not how you love somebody. It is not how I love you. I love you in a whole deeper way. A way that you can't even comprehend. I love you unconditionally. Can you love your spouse unconditionally? Who are you to blow up at her? Who are you to blow up at him? When have I ever blown up on you? And look at what you do every day. Look at how you deal with that. So he touches the issue of sin in a very, very powerful way. And since as Christians we have to deal with sin in our Christian lives, John explains two approaches here that we, we need to have in dealing with sin. Number one, we can try to cover it up ourselves. And number two, or we can conquer sin. We have victory over sin. And he shows us how in these verses. Look at verses three and four. By this we know that we have come to know him. That term know means intimately a personal relationship with him. We, by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The commandment that He gave us is to love one another the way He loves us. That's it. Real simple. Love one another the same way I love you. I sent my Son to die for you because I knew you didn't have the ability within yourself to turn away from sin. So I carried the sin on my own shoulders became a man and took that sin to the cross and put it to death there for you that you might look to me by faith and trust in me. That you might know you're forgiven, intimately know, personally know you're forgiven, and then personally know me. And then he says in verse 4, the one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Those are strong words. The one who cannot love others the way I love them is a liar and the truth is not in him. Strong words. You know, we've all... so so. What he's saying here is we can try to cover our sin. This is one of the things. How we deal with sin. We try to cover it ourselves. We've been taught in the Word of God that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. When we are saved, God called us out of darkness into His light. And you know what we became? We became children of light. And the Word of God teaches us that those who do wrong hate the light. Why? Because the light shines in on us and every time it does, what does it reveal? It reveals the truth about us. What does God say our hearts are? <laughs> They're evil continually. When the light shines in on us, it reveals our heart. Either Christ is there, you got the joy of the Lord, or you're there and it's vile and you don't like what you see. And if that's the case, it, it, we try to cover it up. So, so light produces life and growth, but sin produces darkness, and darkness and light cannot exist in the same place. If we're walking in the light, the darkness has to go. If we're holding on to sin, the light has to go. There's no middle ground in a Christian life. You're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. And if you're walking in the light, there's nothing to cover up. But if you're walking in darkness, you live your life trying to cover your own sin and God's going, I already paid for it. Stop covering it. But Lord, people will find out what I really am. They already know what you really are. We all do. We're sinners saved by grace. 
But if you live your life trying to cover your own sin, the witness of who Christ is and what He's done for you is diminished. It has no effect. And He just shows that in a strong way. So there's no gray area a Christian can walk. You are either walking in the light or you're walking in the darkness. And that's what John does it. And he says here, so how do Christians cover up their sin? Verse 4, the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. How do we cover up our own sins? By telling lies. It says it right here in the Word. By lying. You may say, I don't lie. Mm -hmm. no? You just lie. <laughs> Every lie. And that's what he's talking about. The first thing we do is we lie to others right away. We want our Christian friends to think of us as spiritual, so we lie about our lives and we try to make a favorable impression on them. What We, what we want them to think that we're walking in the light, though in reality we're walking in darkness because we're walking in sin. So we try to put on that, that show. Try to put on something that, that says, I'm, I'm okay. I try to, it, what I'm doing, I'm covering up my own sin when I do that. Secondly, if we tell lies to others, then we're telling a lie to ourselves. That's what he's showing here. Once we begin to lie to others, it doesn't take too much long uh, until we begin to lie to ourselves. And that's what this passage is dealing with. I'm lying, to, I'm trying to cover my sin that's already bought and paid for. And so I cover my sin and I'm lying to you to put on a good show of spirituality and it doesn't take long until John say, you're lying, you're deceiving yourself. You don't realize it, but you're walking, lying to yourself. And, and, and that's the problem. It's not in deceiving others. It's deceiving ourselves. It's possible for a believer to live in sin, yet convince himself that everything is just fine in his relationship with God. Then when King David had an affair with Bathsheba, right? King David looks out, he sees Bathsheba, he lusted after her, he first lusted after her, then he committed adultery with her, her and instead of openly admitting what he did before God, what did he do? He tried to cover it up. How did he do that? He, he said, Yo, send Uriah back to me. Get him drunk. Send him home. He's a man of war. He's not going to go home. He, he, he's going to come back. And with David, all right, go have him killed. What a cover up of a, of a lie. What a cover up of sin. Lie here, lie there. Now, now lying to yourself, he had Uriah killed. Um, David lied to himself. He tried to carry on his royal duties, but God, who knew all about it, sent Nathan the prophet to him, and then he gave him this you know, fabricated story, and David was like, condemn that man. What did Nathan say? You're the man. You yourself are that man. You lied to others. You covered up your sin. You lied to others. And now you're lying to yourself. You had one of your best men killed because of what you did. A strong picture there. Once we begin to lie to others, it's not long before we actually begin to believe our own lies. And if we won't stop there and repent, the spiritual decline becomes much, much worse. Because thirdly, who do we lie to? We lie to God. We sit there and we praise Him. I mean every word of this song, Lord. Every single word. But I'm living in darkness and I'm living in sin and your light is really not in me and I'm just putting on a big show. So I don't, I say I mean the words, I'm loving you with my lips and not with my heart. And that's what He shows here in a very strong way. Once we've made ourselves liars, then we try to make God a liar. We contradict His Word, which says all have sinned, and we maintain that we are the exception to this truth. And we hold on to it. We apply God's words to others, but we won't apply it to our own lives. Like, take this Word that's being taught right now. You could sit there and go, oh, I know so-and-so needs to hear this. They're living in darkness. They're lying to themselves. They're lying to God. 
And God saying, I am talking to you. Have you deceived yourself enough? Now you're calling me a liar? Now you're telling me I don't have the right to call sin, sin in your life and tell you to deal with it? Bring it to the cross of Jesus Christ? Put it to death there? Maybe fall down on your face and repent and turn back to me? That's what, that's what he's shown here. You know, um, we sit in our churches, we sit at Bible studies, and if we're not touched by the teaching of God's Word, we deceive ourselves and we, we call God a liar. And believers who have drifted this way are usually very critical of other Christians, but when the Word of God comes to them, they strongly resist the Word of God in their own life. And then all through the Word of God, we're taught that the human heart lies about everything. The human heart lies about their, their fellowship, about their nature, about their actions. You know, and So we have to be very careful because sin has a deadly way of spreading into our hearts and into our minds and into the lives of others. What God wants from you and I in that as a Christian life is to be honest with ourselves and honest with others and honest to God. Lord, I'm a sinner. You are, you are the only one who can give me the grace to be saved. You are the only way I can be washed clean. There's no other way. And when you call me on sin in my life and you tell me to deal with it, the only place I need to belong is on my face before you, crying out, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. And he says, great, stand up and walk with me. Don't stand up and go back to the old life. Stand up and walk with me. So we try to cover our sin. It produces things in our life. We begin to lie, and, and, it, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough life. And if we just keep going down that road, um, you know, really this passage of Scripture, it describes a believer who's living a dishonest life comes to church, he puts on his spiritual garb, but he's living a phony life. He's playing a role. He's acting a part. He's not a genuine life because actually he's a very insecure life and he has to lie to keep his security secure instead of Christ being his security. Instead of Jesus being the security of your life because of, it was by faith in him. And when a person lives like that, He'll experience losses in his life. And sometimes never know he's experiencing these losses. The first, the first loss that he loses, his first loss, is the Word of God. He stops doing the truth, then the truth is no longer in him, and then he'll turn from truth to lies. And he'll begin to believe in the lies of his own heart. Instead of doing the truth, being obedient to God at His Word, he'll be obedient to himself and what's based on himself, the deception of his own heart. He's basing his life on that. You, you, you cannot read the Word of God profitably while you're walking in darkness. And secondly, a, a dishonest person like that loses something else. He loses his fellowship with God and with God's people. And I've watched this happen, and it's a heartbreaker to me. But, but he, as a result of that, his prayers become empty to him. Worship becomes just a dull routine. And then he starts to become critical of other Christians. And he starts to stay away from church, right? Because the Word of God says, what communion has light with darkness? If you want to know where your heart is before God, look at your fellowship with God and your true fellowship with God's people. If you can, you can, you know, we sin in our lives. We do it throughout the week. I sin during the week. I don't want to. But I was born a sinner. I act the wrong way. I say the wrong thing. I do the wrong thing. Lord, forgive me. That will never stop me from being in fellowship with God's people. It will never stop me from laying down my pride and loving you more than I love myself. Why? Because Christ is the Lord of my heart. He's the Lord of my life. And it should be for every one of us in that. Every one of us should be able to say that without a deception there. And, and then thirdly, 
is the result of the first two. A dishonest believer loses his character. And you note the process here. You start, it starts by telling lies to cover up your sin. And its end result is in you're becoming a liar. And now you're living in lies instead of living in the truth. That's what John's touching on here in these two verses. Verses 3 and 4. So he's saying, so don't cover up your sin. Expose it to God and confess it to Him. And boom, He'll forgive you and you have a fresh start. And I've talked with people about this in different ministry arenas, and some people say, well, then he'll have to forgive me a thousand times a day. So what? He forgives me a thousand times a day. How many times a day does he forgive you? He gives Pete twice as much as me. <laughs> so, but the picture there, don't cover your sin. If you're here today, you know for sure your sin is washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Then when you sin, open your mouth up. Lord, forgive me. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have acted that way. I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. You stand up. Now, there's no guilt. There's no, there's no pressure there. You, you stand up convicted by you. You ask for forgiveness. And you start afresh, a brand new step in your life. Just like that. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ does. And what does Satan do? He comes in when you sin and he begins to tell you, look at how unworthy you are. Look at you. Blew it again. God's not going to take you back. Everybody at church, they hate you. Look at you. They despise you when they see you. And God's saying, you begin to believe your own lies. Don't do that. Don't cover your own sin. Let my blood be the covering for your sin. And you know what? You'll be set free. Set free from what? From deceiving yourself. You'll be set free to then love others the way I love you. You will have fulfilled my commandment to love one another the same way I love you. And then in verses 5 and 6, he's saying we can conquer sin. We can walk in victory. He says, but whoever keeps his word in Him the love of God has been truly perfected. And by this we know that we are in Him. The one who says He abides in Him ought Himself to walk in the same manner as He walked. So John makes it very clear that Christians do not have to sin. You know, John says in his book, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And the secret victory over sin is found right here in the phrase to walk in the same manner as he walked. You know what that means? To walk in the light. To walk in the light. And to walk in the light means to be open and honest and to be sincere before God and man. And the word sincere here comes from two Latin words, sin and sera, which means without wax. Back during the Roman times, the Roman sculptors, when they made a mistake in building a statue, they would fill up the defects with wax. They would make it the same color as the marble, and they'd fill it up to make it look right. And then when you went in to buy a statue, it was a beautiful statue, and you brought it home, and you put it on your mantle. Then the sun came up and went over it, and the wax melted, melted, and you're like, oh, I got wax by the night. That's it. I, I spent all this money and yet it was a defective statue. So some of the big Roman sculptures that, that were very good at what they did, they used to put sincera on it, means without wax. What You're looking at the real thing. And as Christians, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, we should be able to look at each other and when you look at me, you say, I'm looking at the real thing. Nothing waxed over here. Nothing. This is me, 24-7. It's me on my good day. It's me on my bad day. It's me when I don't sin. It's me when I sin. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't have to live my life trying to cover my own life. It's called walking in victory. And it's an amazing truth. I think God wants every believer to know. To walk in the light. And to walk in the light 
means to be honest with God and honest with ourselves and honest with others. It means that when the light begins to reveal my sin, I've got to right away claim it quickly as my own sin and confess it immediately to God and receive His mercy, His forgiveness, and His grace. Right away, when God shows you that attitude is sin, then grab hold of it. Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. That's sin in my life. Please forgive me of that. Help me stop being judgmental of others. I, I, that's sin. Lord, you call it sin. I cannot call it anything else. I have to own it. Yep, that's me. Lord, forgive me. And you know what he does? Boom. You're forgiven. Stand up, leave it behind you, and walk forward and love the people in front of you. Do you ever come walking into a building and you see someone you're like, oh, this bozo. Oh, I'm going to deal with him. God should be able to say to you, you should have an honest, open heart. And God says, hey, bozo. That's sin. That attitude. How do you represent me to that person when that's the attitude of your heart? You know, Lord, you're right. This, this person that you want saved. And you have probably brought him into my life because you know I'm going to get poked. You know I'm going to get pushed. You know I'm going to get mocked and I'm going to get ridiculed. And I'm going to show him you. I'm going to show him you. I'm going to show him who you are. Same way they mocked my Lord. They ridiculed my Lord. They lashed out at my Lord. He looked down and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Lord, I'm here to represent you to a lost and dying world. And I can't do it by covering up my sin. I can do it by conquering my sin by your victory, not by mine. And he begins to show that in a very strong way. Um, walking in the light also implies obeying the word of God. To walk in the light means to spend time daily in God's Word, discovering His will, and then obeying what He's told you from it. Take the time to open up His Word. Walk through the Psalms. We just went through the Psalms right this morning. Great Psalms. And even in our church Bible reading, right? Did you read Romans 13? Everybody read it? Right? Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone, the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly in the day, not carousing in drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. You know, John wrote so many years after Paul. And it's the same context. Put on Christ. Walk in Him. Trust in Him. You have victory over sin. So obedience to God's Word is really the proof for our love for Him. You know there's three motives for obedience? We can obey uh, because we have to. We can obey because we need to, or we can obey because we want to. A slave obeys because he has to. If he doesn't, he'll be punished. An employee obeys because he needs to. may not like his job, but he sure likes his paycheck at the end of the week. And a Christian should obey their Heavenly Father because he wants to. Because the relationship between him and God is one based on God's love for him. God loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you with such a great love. You know, Jesus said in John 14, 5, If you love me, keep my commandments. And my commandments are easy. Love one another the way I love you. you. Want to see if you really love God? Can you love your brother or your sister or your spouse with the same love God loves you? If you can, that says a lot. If you can't, God's saying, check your heart with me. Lay your heart open before me. Be honest. Be sincere. Be without wax. 
You know, I've I said it before, but as a pastor, it is so much easier whether a person is, is really happy or very, very angry. It is so much easier to deal with an honest person than a dishonest person. Because honesty, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, can easily be dealt with because it's honesty. But dishonesty, putting on, a, 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 being fake in it or covering up your own sin, it's really hard because you're trying to speak to someone who's already got a dishonest mother there. And it's, it's totally backwards. You know, think about the way we learned as we grew up. First, as little children, we obeyed because we had to. If we didn't, we'd get spanked. I'm a hunter's learning that right now at home very quick with my daughter. Uh, I think he probably gets maybe 5,000 spankings a day. But he's learning, right? But as we grew up, it wasn't long until we discovered that obedience meant enjoyment and reward. Then we obeyed because it meant certain reward. It's good. I, I was very good all day. Mom said, I can have a movie night tonight with popcorn. Yay! Where's Hunter? In bed. What do you think he's going to do? He could have had a movie night. No, it's okay. You, you start to learn that. And then as you become an adult, really the mark of maturity as an adult is when you start obeying because of love. I really love this person. I really love my sister. I really love my brother. I really love my mom and dad. And they wouldn't discipline. They wouldn't tell me to not do something unless they knew more about it than me. I understand. And then obedience becomes a whole lot simpler because you're obeying out of love. And then walking in the light also means it involves abiding in Christ. His life became for us the perfect pattern to follow. We're called to walk in the light as He is in the light. And walking in the light implies you know, living on this earth the way that Jesus lived when He was here. Living that way. You know, an example, I guess, uh, what a, what's a believer to do when another believer sins against you? All right, you're a believer. What does the Word of God say to do when another believer sins against you? Love them. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Forgive one another, even as God in Christ's sakes has forgiven you. What are we quick to do? <laughs> That person did me wrong. I'm going to wrong you back. And everybody's why? Where's the love of who? God. That person did me wrong. That person did you wrong. Lord. But the wrong they did me will never touch the wrong that was done to you. And you've forgiven me so much. And I will forgive them. And forgiving is what? Forgetting. Peter went to, to Jesus. How many times should we forgive someone? Seven. That's a lot. <laughs> Being Jewish, that's a lot. Seven times. Jesus said, how about 490? How about seven times 70? How about seven times 7,000? How do people see the love of God in us? How do people see the love of God in you? Think about it. Lord, send people in my life. I want to share the gospel with them. So we think people are going to float in. I just got to work. And I, I just wanted to see Christ in you. Can you show me? You know? I want to know who God is. And I want you to show me. No, people come into my life, uh, our lives. And they go, yeah, they're only Christians, huh? Poke. <laughs> What are you always smiling for? You're so ugly, your mother dresses you funny. Yeah, get out of here. What do we do? We love them back with the love that God gave us. We show them who our Lord and Savior really is. We don't, we don't express it here. We walk it. We walk in the light as He is in the light. If I'm walking in darkness and somebody steps into my life and God has sent them there to see Christ, and I'm walking in darkness. What are they going to get from me? A slug right on the back of the head. Because I can't take it anymore. But if I'm walking in the light as He is in the light, what they're going to get from me is Christ. Take the shot. 
When someone pokes you, take the shot. Let them see Christ in you. It's not easy to do, is it? It's not an easy walk. Because it might be from someone you love very much. It might be from the person you don't even really realize is the one that's there. And God's saying, love them the way I love you. You want to see them change? Well, it's been 20 years. I ain't seen no change yet. Let's keep loving them. Don't stop. Because I have never stopped loving you. And I never will. So walking in the light will actually have an effect on every area of your life, especially in your home. And no matter what area of life it may be, it's our responsibility to do what Jesus would do. It says, as He is, so are we in the world. We're to walk in the same manner as He walked. That means abiding in His love. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Everybody get that? Those last few words are the most important. Without me, you cannot do anything. There's nothing you can do. You never have the ability on your own, in your old nature. It'll never happen. It's in the new nature I've given you, and that's by faith in me. And if you've trusted Christ to be your Savior, you have that new nature. It's not, it doesn't take more prayer. It takes simple, a step of obedience to be obedient to the new nature within you. That's the leading, guiding, and directing of the Holy Spirit, especially in the teaching of His Word. So to you and I who believe, to the believers, right? Jesus Christ lives His life through us by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. So through obedience to Him, we can live in victory over sin and we can see it conquered in our lives. So the two things that we face as believers when we deal with sin is we, we can try to cover it up and we end up walking in darkness or we can conquer it by walking in the light. And what God has done is He's made provisions for us in these ways to conquer sin. We can never lose or change our sin nature that we were born with, but we need not obey its desires. We have the new nature that produces the fruits of the Spirit that enable us to turn away from the old nature. If you don't have the new nature in you, there's no way on earth you can turn away from the old nature. But to have the new nature within you, you begin then to listen to the Word of God. You read His Word, seek His face. You get in fellowship with God's people. You hear His Word taught and you listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. He may be saying to you, step by faith here. He may be saying to you, forsake that. It's sin. Drop that attitude. Turn around and love that person. The way I love you, whatever it may be. Go give a cup of cold water to a child and do it with joy in your heart. Not with an ulterior motive, but be obedient to the Lord. The second you step in obedience, boom, it bears fruit immediately. Did you ever live your life in sin and at the very last second you go, you know, I'm not going to do this. I turn from this. Your word says that's not what you want me, so I'm turning away. And you feel low, you feel dirty, you feel unworthy, and you say, Lord, forgive me for even taking a step down that road. And boom, fresh, a brand new. You're driving down the road, you put the, the, the radio station on, a Christian song, and you're praising the Lord. How do you go from there to there in a matter of three seconds? Obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit as He prompts you in your heart. The Father says that's sin in your life. That attitude, that thing, whatever it may be, that thought. Take it captive, lay it down at the foot of the cross. Lord, forgive me for that. Get up and then walk by faith and trust me. That's the Christian walk right there. It's a very, very strong one. If we sin, we confess immediately to God, the cleansing power of His blood washes us clean before Him. And it all begins with the openness and honesty before God and men. The minute we start to act the part or pretend, the minute we start to impress others, 
we step out of the light and we're stepping into the shadows of darkness without even realizing it. That's why there's so many warnings in the Word of God. Stay on the path. What's the path? The light. Walk in the light. How do I do that? Walk the same way He walked. How do I know that? Read the book of John. Read His Word. Read Paul's writings. He tells us exactly how a Christian ought to walk. Read the book of Colossians. You'll find out what to put aside in your life, what to throw away in your life, what to make more important in your life. Where to set your mind on those things. And then stepping in obedience to that, it just bears fruit in our life. And you know, when you walk in the light, you then begin to live to please only one person. And that's the Lord. All of a sudden you're like, you know what? You know what I realized? I could never fully please my wife. Because I'm human. I just can't do it. I would never, I could never fully please you. There's somebody in this fellowship right now. You take everybody here. You come up and say, that was a great sermon, man. Six months later, I hate you so I won't talk to you again. I'm not going to church anymore. It's miserable. I can't even hear you. You're like, well, what happened there? It, it's a matter of the heart there. If you walk in the light, you only live to please one person. That's the Lord. When I step down from this pulpit, I'm satisfied if I know He's pleased. Now, I'm not encouraged or satisfied if you tell me you're pleased. That doesn't work with me. I want to hear Him. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's all I need to hear. Press on, press on and prep for the next one. And for the next one, and for the next one. Pressing on in that. You know, when you're dealing with sin in your life, I think really what John's saying in these four verses is walk in the light. And learn what that means. To take those steps to walk as Jesus walked. And you know what? It will bear fruit in your life. It will bear fruit in such a strong way as that if Gnosticism ever tries to enter your life, you'll just be like, get out of here. I have no use for you. I walk with my Lord. I walk in His Word. And I'm led by His Holy Spirit. And you've got nothing for me, Gnosticism. I, I can't even have anything to do with you. That's based off human knowledge, not faith and understanding of God's Word. So John hits it right on the head. It's a strong word, but a very important word as believers. This is our walk and where to walk in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace that you've given us to be here today, to walk through your Word, to hear again what it means to walk as a believer. Father, I pray that you take your word that was taught today, that you would plant it deep in every heart, that it would be watered by your Holy Spirit, that it might take root there and begin to grow so the enemy cannot steal it away. Lord, let it bear fruit that would strengthen our testimony and our witness of Jesus Christ, of what you've done in our lives, what, what you've accomplished for us. And let that testimony, that witness, Go bear fruit, Lord. We live in America. The ample waves of grain help us reach them all. We ask in Jesus' name.